Hi folks, Lou here to talk, I hope fairly briefly, about the fundamentals of interaction in games and puzzles. And I think this is a topic that you could just about write a book on, but we'll see what we can do in 10 minutes or less. Now always, I'm talking about games for more than two players. So, to briefly consider two-player games, um, you can still have interaction with the game system and interaction with the other player, but typically two-player games are war games and they have a lot of interaction between the players. So I'm talking about games for more than two. And interaction in games for more than two has much to do with the possibilities for negotiation. The other big determiner is the attitudes of the players. So for example, when hardcore diplomacy players play another game, there's a good chance that negotiation will be involved if the game provides the opportunity because diplomacy players are accustomed to negotiating everything. That's the nature of the game diplomacy. When players of standard Euro style games play another game, negoti negotiation is quite unlikely because it hardly exists in Euro style games unless the game demands it. Now, much of this is based on whether you can help or hinder the other players in the game. And in many games, you cannot. Rarely is there no interaction between players, but the interaction, which is often direct, tends to be incidental to most play in some games because you can't help or hinder the other players, or you can only very marginally hinder the other player by, say, blocking a particular move. I call these games parallel competitions. I used to call them contests. A common name for them is multiplayer solitaire. They're like many Olympic sports, especially races. For example, a swimming race. There's nothing within the rules you can do to help or hinder other players. Now, there's also always the possibility of psyching people out and so on, but that's not part of the rules of the game. If you interact a lot with other players in the game, there are usually ways that you can hinder or help them. That's the nature of the interaction. Now, the, the broader question is, are you interacting with the other players or with the game itself? Games have two parts, the system part, the game, and the psychological part when there's more than one player. So when a player does anything, he or she is usually interacting with either the game or the players. Solitaire games involve only interaction with the game. There are no other players. Parallel competition players are to a greater or lesser extent interacting with the game alone. All interaction in a puzzle is with the game. Though even there, conceivably, the player might try to divine what the designer intended, and that is kind of one-sided interaction with the designer. So you don't often have a pure situation where it's one or the other. Although, say, a jigsaw puzzle is a pure puzzle. What I'm interested in in this presentation is interaction among the players. Games can be designed to deliberately offer ways to hinder or help the other players, or to ensure that any such way is usually incidental. Diplomacy is known as a uh, cutthroat game. People make deals, they break deals, and so on. It is, in fact, one of the most highly cooperative games in the world, because you have to cooperate with other players to succeed. You're outnumbered six to one. But that cooperation is um, obscured because of the reputation for it being cutthroat and for it being backstabs and so on. Low player interaction games, again, what I call parallel competitions, are forms of puzzle. They have always correct solutions the players are trying to find and pursue. But these are um, paths to victory and there's usually more than one. A peer puzzle has, can have multiple uh, solutions, but often just has one solution. 
Now, finding the path to victory and following it does not require player interaction. It requires interacting with the game. High interaction games that have no always correct solution, which would be a dominant strategy, which is a no-no in games but not in puzzles, um, those can be called opposed games. And they derive, of course, especially from two-player games. Another uh, set of terms for this is open and closed games. Closed games are intended to have one or more solutions. A jigsaw puzzle, again, is a maximally closed game. Open games, which might be called opposed games, are intended to provide ways for people to interact with one another far more than with the game. Pure closed games are formal puzzles. Pure open games are rare. There's usually some interaction with the game system, even in games like poker and diplomacy, which are very much about player interaction. A pure puzzle is a single player experience. The interaction was, is with the system and distantly with the puzzle designer. Now as an aside here, many cooperative games amount to puzzles because there's one side that's the game and the other side that's the players, but the players interact with each other as they solve the puzzle. Another way to summarize what I've been saying is how much does the player interact with the psychological part of the game and how much with the system part? Notice that there's no Yomi reading or divining the intentions of another player in a pure puzzle, but there may be a, a lot of Yomi in a highly player interactive game. If you think of warfare, the most successful generals are often those who can employ Yomi, again, reading or divining the intentions of the enemy, in order to take advantage of what they're about to do. Now, attitudes are important, and I'm going to quote at length from Alex Harkey. Quote, it is wise for game designers to pay attention to how much a game is dependent on everyone adopting a specific mindset. Players who don't play, open quote, correctly, close quote, can feel inadequate and experienced players can feel like their entire game is dependent on someone else. Here we have a fundamental difference between gamers and puzzlers. This is a puzzle gamer's point of view. There is no play correctly in a, in a game, an opposed game. There is in a puzzle. Another quote, think of this as a player feeling positive about their situation, having built a small, well-defended and strategically sound empire. After their turn, each of the four opponents takes significant turns in which affect the entirety of the battlefield. At the beginning of the following turn, through no particular fault of their own, their empire is in shambles and their enthusiasm is lost simply because they were in the wrong position at the wrong time. Alex Harkey. No, not at all. Life is not fair, and neither are games. Whose fault is this? It's the player's fault, much of the time. The player should be talking with other players to ensure that they don't get clobbered by all four of them through the course of a turn. The notion that you can play your own position without regard for what others are doing and thinking is the basis for this failure and arises from the puzzle mentality, interacting only with the game. Some people like chaos, the improvisers. Alex is talking, it appears, as though every game player is a planner. But even planners need to take control, not just suppose they won't be bothered. Planner puzzlers is what he's talking about, who are one solution folks, who are passive players. That passivity is very important. There's an attitude of those who dislike negotiations in games that they can be passive rather than active game players. In opposed games, you need to be an active player, especially if it's a well-designed game. If you want to be passive, stick to puzzles and puzzle-like parallel competitions. Interaction with other players is the essence of negotiation, and that requires activity, not passivity. Open games for more than two players often require negotiation, although 
many of those games suppress it by not allowing secret negotiation. Closed games don't offer hooks that allow negotiation to make a difference, that is, uh, something that allows you to help or hinder the opposition. Thanks for listening.